Hello fans, this is Dr. Jolle Kerpenstein from the Per Podcast and I'm so excited today because we have a very special edition. It's a live session uh, that was taped at VMX 2019. So thank you VMX team and it's together with Dr. Susan Little and Dr. Sue Ettinger. So I hope you enjoy this edition of the Per Podcast. It is Per Podcast Live, the first one ever. Thank you so much for listening. Sorry for saying Sorry Media presents the Purr Podcast. The best podcast for feline medicine and surgery with tips, tricks, and updates for the entire veterinary healthcare team. If you're dying to know more about cats, keep on listening. Here are your hosts, Dr. Susan Little, famous cat vet and textbook author, and Dr. Yola Kerpenstein, talented surgeon and social media geek. And thanks very much to our, our uh, tech support. Yes, let's do an applause for the tech yes, support. Yes, thank you. Yay. Yep. Yay. Who at the last minute have pulled this all together and who, um, who are trying really hard to make Mike stay um, on our oddly shaped ears, apparently. I know, I know. I know. Yeah. And, and it's really cool. So uh, this is Dr. Susan Little. My name is Dr. Yola Kerpenstein, and we have the amazing Dr. Sue. Yay. I snuck excellent, in. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. So Dr. Susan and I were in Brazil driving around. We did so many lectures, and yeah, the did. one thing that we noticed that is that one, there is not a lot of information about cats, and who doesn't love cats? So dead silence. Dead silence. Room. I love it. So That's who not a loves good cats? Sign. That's it. Yes. Okay. Exactly. You're being recorded now. Remember, exactly. make us look good. Yes. Okay. So Can I hold an applause sign. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah you like should. That. Yeah. You good. should. So, so we we came up with the idea. Maybe we should start a podcast. And how many people have listened to the podcast? Yeah. Have any of you listened yet? Ooh. It's a baby podcast, so it's baby okay podcast, if you haven't. Yes. I have. Oh, oh one, thank one goodness. person. Oh yes. wow! So there's <laughs> lots of. Uh, I, I'm feeling I have. I'm, I'm getting <laughs> videotaped. Absolutely, absolutely. This is okay. Dr. Sue uh, right there. This is so Dr. Sue in her ab- social media role I know, right now. I love yeah. it. So, so we started this podcast about cats. Yep, last summer. It's called the Per Podcast, mm-hmm. and we are really excited about it. And you are our first live audience, so yep. this is so awesome. So, so uh, I'll show you the um, how you access it. But really, any if you any of you listen to podcasts or you have a podcast app on your phone, if you just search Per Podcast, you'll find us um i'll i'll uh, show you some more contact information in a minute we have like 15 or 16 episodes out uh, i think uh, 17 ish? yes 17 yeah. episodes out yes. on a whole variety of topics in feline medicine um a few of them are just yola and i chatting about like what's current in the literature but mm. most of them are with some guests so you know yes. people like stan marks um uh, we admit we recorded with Mary Gardner while we were here. Sheila mm. Robertson's mm. been on. Who else? Keep reminding me. Who else has been on our podcast? Lots of other people. Lots of other people. Okay. So, um, okay. but the good thing is that there are n- almost no rules. Only for, there's one rule. Yeah, we have there's one rule. There's one rule for anybody, and that is you cannot say the D word. During the podcast. So, yeah. and the interesting thing is anytime we say it to the speaker, the speaker immediately says, the word. Yeah, because then we've put it in their head, right? Mm-hmm. And then they can't help but say the D word. And yes. the consequences for saying the D word during the podcast, you have to buy us a drink. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. our podcasts vary from one drink to a magnum or yeah. a whole it's case. It's highly variable. Depending on yeah. uh, the person that we interview. So yeah. we have high expectations of Dr. Yeah. Sue uh, saying... I'm tagging you in the post. <laughs> oh, excellent. excellent. <laughs> she didn't pay attention. So, yeah, yeah. you know, Ooh, it's, we'll get her. Um, it will be wonderful. Yeah. So, so use so, the D word. Uh, right. Yes, okay, good. Right. <laughs> yes, right. So, no, but we're really excited that you're here. And uh, and uh, like I said, it's the first time. We're a bit nervous. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I think I'll be more nervous when we get the recording and I listen to it. I'll yeah. probably be a little more <laughs> nervous then. Yeah, yeah. So, but we have a lot of fun doing it. And it is it is not high tech and that sort of things. But most of the people that we talk with are amazing. Yes. Like Dr. Sue. So, we're really excited that she's here and helping us a little bit by talking this topic. Yeah. We have no idea where we're going most of the time because we normally don't have slides we will show you some slides to keep it a little bit alive yeah what you'll notice we will describe the slides because obviously when the other people are listening they cannot see it uh, except when they're psychics Um, (laughs) but um, so we'll show you the slides uh, but we might not follow the slides completely 
Especially Dr. Seuss slides. <laughs> so when she's on, um, then, we're, they going changed to my talk, slides. Yeah, then <laughs> we're going to talk about really something completely sure different. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm not yeah. afraid and, uh, of... There's okay. a very important person coming in. Yes. Looks like it. I know. I hope he doesn't oh. have bad news. He looks like the type of guy no, who walks in with bad news. Okay. okay, perfect, perfect. So, so, good. <laughs> so uh, let's start. Everybody yes. ready? Ready? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Woo! Okay. Excellent. Woo, that sounds good. I love it. So we are going to talk about GI disease. We're going to talk... Um, uh, we're going to do a talk that Yola and I often do on um, GI foreign bodies. Um, and because another really common uh, GI disease presentation in cats is uh, GI lymphoma. And I know some of you were in the room with uh, Dr. Sue and I did a talk earlier today. So we're going to try to marry that all together. So that should be fun. So we are really happy to have Dr. Sue as our special guest. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. In her head, she's going like delete contact for Susan Little in my phone at this mm -hmm. moment. Never. Yeah. Yeah. Never. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, we just want to point out, uh, we'll, you'll see our contact information um, through this next hour. Um, Dr. Sue, and we'll show you this again, she has an amazing uh, Facebook group, and she'll tell you a little bit more about um, the, why you would want to be on her Facebook group. And before the next slide, I really want to thank VMX for allowing doing this. Yeah. Uh, Tom Bone, we told them we would like to do this about minute. a week before yes. VMX. So yeah. they made this happen. That's why we're kind of cramped in a small little room because yeah. they had set these rooms already weeks and weeks, weeks before. Yeah. But I'm really happy that they did that. And yes. uh, who doesn't like VMX? Yeah, you know? so. <laughs> Haven't they so done we're very an grateful. amazing job? I think that uh, every year they're surprising me more. So give a big yep. hand of applause yep. for VMX Thanks. and Tom. Yep. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. So uh, uh, Yola and I both like social media, and Dr. Sue does as well. And so there's lots of ways to connect with us on social media. So um, if you're you know, interested in following uh, people on especially Instagram or, or Twitter, you'll often find some updates from us there on mm -hmm. our uh, adventures in, in, yeah. uh, in the veterinary world. Yeah. 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 You'll never know what you'll see. Um, so if you have, who has an iPhone in the room? Okay, so you may have heard me see, uh, talk about this earlier today. Just open your uh, camera app and aim it at the QR code. Oh, let me move away. Yeah, not Yola's head, no. at, the, at the QR code. So there's a QR code on the screen, and it will take you to the Per Podcast website. And that's where you can find all of the links to the episodes and descriptions of the episodes. I don't know how well it works on an, on an Android because I never tried it. But I know on an iPhone, if you just point the camera at it, it should pop up with a, a link, and it'll take you directly to the page, right? Okay. And I love our logo. Uh, yes, I do mm -hmm. like our logo. Yeah. So um, the website is just perpodcast.net. Yes. So if you're not scanning it, it's just perpodcast.net. Yes. For all Android lovers. Yes. Just okay. Perpodcast.net. And it's, uh, again, if you want to follow us on social media, the podcast tag is at perpodcast. So we're pretty easy across all social media platforms. If you just search for at perpodcast, you, uh, you will find us. So, and we'll, you know, we, uh, we tend to uh, just keep up to date on what episodes we have out, what episodes are coming up, um, and uh, what, what's going on in our little podcast world, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And as a matter of fact, here you can see kind of the setup yeah. of the podcast. It's yes. a big mess, but yes. we just use a computer and a, a, lot of coffee. Uh, Takes a lot speaker of coffee. and yeah. some, uh, some yeah. things. So it's Yeah, we were actually recording mm -hmm. uh, an interview before yeah, you did. all came into the room. Yes. So, yeah. So, and we'll be recording two more yeah. after this, so... So uh, I just want to give due uh, credit and thanks to some of our colleagues because we're going to be, as we talk about especially foreign bodies, we're going to be sharing some cases that Yola and I have, but we're also uh, found some really cool cases that some of our colleagues agreed to share with us as well. So I just like to give due credit. And for the purposes of the podcast, I'll just mention that we um, are really grateful to people like Mark Peterson, Randolph Barrel, uh, Tommy Monaco, Giorgio Romanelli. I like that. Mm -hmm. um, Daniel Ogden. You're going to have to say the next name. Cause Lotte gonna... Barons von Kahn. Yeah, because like he knows how to say that. In uh, Dutch. In, uh, in Dutch. Claire de Roy Bordenave. Very good. Jonathan Gray <laughs> and Maurizio Annoni. Uh, uh, very good. Yeah, you're Italian. doing well. Doing okay. well so. so thank you very much to our yes. colleagues. Okay, so this is where we usually start when we're talking about um, foreign bodies. So this is a study that um, gives us a really good jumping off point. So it's a study that looked at a bunch of dogs and cats with foreign bodies and uh, looked at a lot of characteristics of these cases. So within this group, there was 24 feline cases and 184 canine cases. We are allowed to say canine. Yeah, not, not D, but canine. Oh. Because okay. now we're referring to, to, to the tooth. Uh, the tooth. There is a canine loophole. tooth. Okay. Otherwise, you can't say yeah. it. All right. you know? So what's the first thing that says to you? 24 cat cases, 184 dog cases. What's it? Dogs are stupider than cats. Hey. 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 You just said the D word. Uh oh. You're buying the first round. I don't care. Yes. It was worth it. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right? You see, more dogs eat like rocks. Yes. Come on. Yes. Dogs eat rocks. Yes. Come on. 
yes. So unfortunately, when cats eat things, though, they tend to eat things that are far more injurious to their GI tract, like sewing needles and thread and so on. So cats might not do it as often, but they tend to uh, eat bad things. So let and me take the D word over okay. so you don't make that mistake okay. again. So No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so... so uh, but all of you have seen this too, that you will have patients that are repeat offenders. Who's had a repeat mm-hmm. offender? Yeah, right? They're back over exactly. and over. Okay, so my record is a Siamese cat named Cleo who had, count them, six exploratory laparotomy surgeries. So it's probably an obsessive compulsive mm-hmm. disorder in this cat. And you would never take like one thing out of her stomach. You would take like, you know, four, five, six different objects. She was quite eclectic. Why you know? take one if you Why? can take them all? She collected a variety of objects, mm-hmm. right? She was very deliberate in her collecting of, um, skills. Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, we see uh, a very similar uh, pattern with the D word that they will also be um, repeat offenders. So I think that's all, always something when you have the first episode in uh, either species that it's just worth mentioning to the owner sometimes, you know, and Siamese, I don't know, you're an oncologist, sorry, Siamese. <laughs> the respect. Her. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> foreign body, you know. But si- yeah. I don't know about you, but Siamese like are high on my list of, of breeds that tend to be repeat offenders. So I'll at least plant the idea on the owner's mind that we really have to be careful. Just talking about it, I had a D and I had a C or yes. a cat that yes. ate uh, foreign bodies because they had cancer. Have you seen that? Ah, that's a good Dr. question, they, Dr. They were trying Sue. to te- like start to vomit so their owners would bring them to the hospital and diagnose the cancer. Uh-huh. So, as a matter of fact, though, this was a, a seven-year-old Irish setter that, that a lot. came in with a uh, stomach torsion and a foreign body, and he had a pancreatic tumor. So I think he was nauseated. And yeah, I wonder if there's some things. Lincoln Abbott so eating behavior. Kind of pica yeah. behavior. So, yeah, yeah. Interesting. I yep. thought it was really interesting. Yeah. But Very interesting. So always look. So th- this is my little spiel. I'm going on my soapbox. If you open up something, always look at the whole abdomen. So although it's a GDV and, you know, we all mm, know it can true. do, we can do it in 20 minutes. If you open the abdomen up, always look a little further. Because, yeah, look at so, everything and never yes. leave empty handed, right? Exactly. Yeah. That's true. Those are good rules. Okay. So in this study, they did a little bit of compare and contrast cats with the lesser species. And one of the things that they noticed, of course, that the mean age is pretty similar. It tends to be young animals that do this, right? It's not common that we'll see like a middle-aged or even a senior uh, animal of either species that comes in for the first time. And the breed disposition is mine only, as you can see in uh, the category, the D word again. But... It has nothing to do with intelligence, obviously, because the Border Collie is part of it. So that is supposed to be the most intelligent dog around. So, <laughs> mm. oh, oh, uh. Uh, <laughs> Darn. What kind of dog? Darn. You have a Labrador, right? You said it now, yes. too. I know. I, mean, I know. You know it's Sue that's I going to be liquored up tonight. I have two, and the young one is less than two years of age. So okay. she's in that prime. Yeah. I'm Rock gonna, eating. Yeah, she's going to she's gonna eat the Kong frisbee that she adores. Yeah. So. Mm. yeah. Okay. So there are yeah. some major differences, though. Yeah. So definitely breed predisposition is one. Now I have mentioned Siamese. That wasn't a big study, so probably just not enough cats. But you know, if I had to pick a breed predisposition mm. in my mind, I'd pick Siamese and related breeds. Mean duration of clinical signs, very similar, but it, it lo- it's not like a day or two. It's like five, six. It's a mm. week sometimes. Uh, of clinical signs, probably because they're vague at the beginning, before the owner will finally bring them in and they eventually get diagnosed. And people tend to wait. So, people tend oh, to wait. I lost all these things that normally were there, and they don't yeah, they think don't about notice. their yeah. repeat <laughs> offender that has already done it seven yeah. times. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Where are all those ponytail ties gone? Mm-hmm. Well, they're in the cat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so here's where we see some big differences, of course, between the species because of the different types of foreign bodies they tend to mm. ingest, right? So as you can see, linear foreign bodies, you know, your dental floss, your thread, your string, much more common in cats than um, in the other species. So therefore, you're more likely to have uh, a foreign body that is not easily palpable in the cat. So I think that makes the distinction. So And why isn't? Why, why do they eat the, the string foreign mm-hmm. bodies? Yeah, so, uh, so here's, 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 here's my theory. theory. Here's your theory, and then theory. we get Dr. Seuss' theory, and then... Okay, so yeah. here's my theory. So what's on a cat's tongue? Like those papillas, right? Mm-hmm. Right? Is that what, that's what you call them, I hope. <laughs> anyway, that's what I call them. Yeah. And which way do they point? They kind of point backwards. Mm-hmm. So I think once they pick up something and start chewing on it or exploring it, it easily gets caught mm-hmm. on the papilla, and then they start to swallow, and then we're off to the races. Mm-hmm. That's my theory. What's okay. your theory? Uh, no, Dr. Sue first. Oh, okay. Well, I don't have a theory, but 
you told the story. So my uh, one of my oncology nurses, lovely Australian accent, but she had adopted an FELV positive cat, but she had a multi cat household. Yeah. So the cat was living in her bathroom, and every day she'd come home from work and she'd take her ponytail and put it on the top of the shampoo bottle, uh-huh. and. She, she, a lot of, where where have they gone? Mm. And it's just like maybe I, I left them in my room, and then her cat started to vomit. My husband's an intern, as he scoped over fifty hair ties out of the cat's stomach. Wow! And she's yeah. like, oh, well, that's where my went. hair ties yeah. went. Yeah. So but the forty ninth time, she thought, hmm, maybe it's the cat. <laughs> That's okay. good. That's the other, good. Crazy. The other thing I take crazy. away from that is that's a woman with a lot of ponytail ties. She had that's really a- <laughs> long hair. Yeah. 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 I really. mean, even so, that's really. a ponytail really. tie collection really. right there. Really. Yeah. yeah. So, so my theory, no theory. theory, but other than you just have to hide that stuff from your My cats. theory is behavioral, though, and it's this i- iatrogenic. So people love to tease cats with things that are stringy. Mm-hmm. So they're kind of teaching them to play with them and that sort of things and they you know it's nice to pet them ar- around so I, I think we need to look if there's a link for people that do that and people uh, that don't yeah, that's a good idea. and see if there is if, yeah. if there's a difference and True. then then your theory comes in that okay, you know, so as soon as they start licking it it automatically moves to the back maybe we're both kind of right mm-hmm. but yeah. why do they yeah. eat needles though yeah because it's attached to, to a piece string. of thread yeah. come on ah. Excellent. Yola, it's attached okay, to a piece yeah, of no, bread. I'm just, you're not just testing you. Yeah, that's why. Okay. You don't have to be testy there with me. There testing you again. Yeah, mm-hmm. I know. I she warned, warned you. me. I w- she warned me. I warned her. Mm. So I came anyway. <laughs> we do see some other differences. And again, it's because of the types of foreign bodies they ingest. So cats are a little bit less likely to get a complete obstruction. Um, mm. Dogs, so at least, again, this is one case series, but about 70% of those dogs did have a complete obstruction. So that's a significant difference. I need to stop. Um, (laughs) So, but look, despite that, almost all these cases ended up in surgery, which makes Yola very happy. Yay! So one of the things we'll talk a little bit about is how do you make decisions or make, give advice to the owner about what's the best path, you know, should you go conservative? Should you go in there with a scope if you have it? Or do you cut them? So we'll talk a little bit about that. And the nice thing about the podcast is that Susan is the medical person. I'm the (laughs) surgeon. So we have a little friction here and there. (laughs) Just friendly friction. Yeah, because I... I try to save my patients from surgeons. That's my job. Mm, yeah. Nice. Although, you know, nice, Susan. Them. Yeah. <laughs> Good job. So look at the difference in complete recovery. So, so overall, the rate is pretty high. But if you've got a linear foreign body, that really reduces your chance of having a complete recovery. Whether you're actually of either species, it reduces your chances of recovery. And again, it just speaks to the amount of trauma that that linear foreign body can do in a short period of time. Yes. Remember, some of these animals were five, six days before they actually came into the veterinarian. So that's a lot of time for a linear foreign body to be, to be doing trauma. And as a matter of fact, linear formality is on my list of uh, top five things to cut open immediately. So yeah. I don't wait with them. I yeah. don't want to wait for anything. And there's not a lot of things that you can get me out of bed after 2 a.m. in the morning. But <laughs> linear form buddies are one of them. So, okay. Uh, That's good to know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> good to know. Call me anytime. Hey everyone, it's Tom Bond with the North American Veterinary Community. Does it get any better than listening to a podcast with Drs. Yola Kerpenstein and Dr. Susan Little, two of the best in the industry, and we are so proud as NABC to be sponsoring this podcast and hoping that you're going to get ready to join us at VMX 2020, coming to Orlando in January of 2020. Hope to see you there, and we'll have more conversations about feline foreign objects, other types of foreign objects like the corn cob that my old English sheepdog swallowed. Make sure you join us. Thanks. I just <laughs> want to point out that there's differences oh, in yeah. where they get stuck uh, because cats have so many Lydia for bodies. Most of them get stuck in the f- beginning of the GI tract. Everybody knows that they kind of clump in the stomach and then they mm. go through the tract and then the tract kind of rolls up on it. That's or it very gets typical. caught under the tongue. Or it gets caught yeah. under the tongue. So. Yeah. 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 And in dogs, it you know, could be anywhere. Stuck anywhere. So. Yeah, so, you know, it's another good example of how, like, you cannot treat um, cats as a small member of the lesser species because there is a difference when it comes, especially to foreign bodies, yep. right, in how we're going to approach these guys. Okay, so, um, so uh, Dr. Sue and I had a session earlier today when we were talking about IBD and lymphoma, and I said that cats have, like, you know, four clinical signs, and they use them for every disease. <laughs> like, is it not true? Mm-hmm. Like, you look up the list of clinical signs, I challenge you, for just about any disease, and it'll always say vomiting, anorexia, you know, diarrhea, probably lethargy, 
right? Those will generally be your four clinical signs. So Weight this loss. is the challenge with cats. They don't have localizing clinical signs. It's um, easy to check off, though, though. Yeah, it is you easy know. to check off. So, yeah, you can okay, just make, your, make your medical <laughs> record templates, yes. like every template, vomiting, diarrhea, anorexia. Yeah, they're all the same. Yeah. Uh, but, of course, in some of these cases, you may see more profound uh, signs of nausea. Remember that cats can be nauseous without vomiting, mm. and owners are not good appreciating what nausea looks like. So it can be drooling, it can be turning the head aside, it can be lip smacking, doesn't have to be. So if you ask the owner if the cat's nauseous, they often don't know because they think nausea is a, uh, equates to vomiting. Yeah. I think it's easier in the D species to see if they're nauseous. Maybe, yeah. yeah. I don't know. What do you think? Dr. Because Sue. you have to deal with... I don't think... I mean... Do you think they're both hard? I, I think it's so hard for both, both owners of both species to be yeah. able to tell the difference exactly what you're mm. saying. Yeah. A lot of the times, and it may be that they're eating human food, and then the owner's like, oh, but they're eating. Mm. But they're not eating their regular food, or they're hand-feeding them, or things like that. And I tell them that's often a sign that they're, they're nauseated, and yeah. they're like, oh... And they just don't go to use those medications. And yep. So I think it's really hard. Vomiting is pretty obvious, mm. right? Yep. But I think if... And the other thing we were talking about with my own cats, I was in a multi-cat household, and one cat was eating really well, and the other cat was losing weight, but the bowl was always empty. Yes. Mm. And so it can be really, really hard in a mm. multi-cat household to figure out who's vomiting, who's yep, not who's eating. eating. Yep. And sometimes you need your mother-in-law coming into town for Thanksgiving to say your cat looks skinny. <laughs> and why? Did I you thought you were a in- veterinarian. And <laughs> my husband's an internist, and I'm not kidding. So our cat had lost three pounds. Oh and wow! We're only don't human. judge. <laughs> so, um, are you missing any hair bends too? Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> our cats did not do the yeah. linear foreign body. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. But it just shows you it's tough. It yes. is really tough when you're yeah. with your pet every day yep. to be able to tell that. So yeah, absolutely. And he had IBD. There you go. So we have to be uh, fairly proactive in getting the information out of the owner because they might not know what they know. You know what I mean? They've noticed things. They just don't know how to interpret it. They don't know that you want to know it. So I think you have to be quite careful with your questioning um, on these cases. Right. Um, there's Dr. Peterson, which is why I credited mm-hmm. him. He's an amazing cat vet. He is. He um, is one of the best uh, cat handling veterinarians um, that I know. So a little tip to Mark. Uh, hats off to Mark Peterson. So physical exam findings again. Weight loss, dehydration, feeling depressed. Helpful so far? Yeah, not mm. so much, right? Um, but depending on how sick they are, whether they've had a perforation, uh, you know, a more serious complication, then you might start to see things like fever or abdominal discomfort or, you know, uh, worst case scenarios, things like septic shock. Uh, shock and and that's a big difference, once again, with the yeah. D. I think when the dog gets abdominal pain, yeah. they have this defense and you can feel it. I yeah. mean, you touch them and it's like... <laughs> Yeah, cats are a little cats more stoic. much more difficult, yeah. I think. So. Yeah, so even, you know, the cat that's coming in with a linear form body, you, even your physical exam may not be that helpful to mm-hmm. you in, 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 uh, in figuring out what's wrong with that cat, right? Because a lot of cats just start off down the same pathway. That doesn't mean you same. shouldn't do a physical exam. Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> please. No, no. Okay, please. that's a good because point. Because, you know, we're life, you know? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So... Um, Oh, we're going to make a big plea to you to do a good physical exam. We're going to show you a few pictures of why, especially with cats, it's really important that yeah. you do um, a good physical exam with these guys, right? Mm-hmm. Especially that, and we're going to show you what we mean in a minute. Look at both ends of the cat. You're okay. giving it away already. I know, I know. But, okay. You always do that. I know. But it was on the slide. What can I say? So this is one of my patients, um, a young male cat, who came in with vomiting, some anorexia, and some lethargy. And this cat just shows the importance of a complete physical exam. So can you see what's trapped under his tongue? It's dental floss. Mm. He's got dental floss under his tongue. These, are, these linear form bodies under the tongue are really hard to see. Who among you has missed one? I've missed them. I've missed them on patients, right? They're hard to see. So I'll, I'll tell you two things. So one trick I have, it's a little hard to see on the image, but what I'm doing is I've got one finger and I'm poking it up between the mandibles so that the root of the tongue is elevated in the mouth so I can see underneath it. Okay, so make sure you do that. You elevate between the mandibles and push it up. But I think it's even better to do it under sedation. So that, that was exactly my second point. So if you can't get a good look, if you're not absolutely sure, and it's especially a young cat, right, that could have a linear form body, you have to sedate and examine that cat. This is just not something you can miss. The consequences of missing this are huge, right? So and when you're in surgery and you try to pull it out and you feel some resistance yeah. to the back and to the front, you know you're in trouble. Yeah. So yeah. it's, it's kind of embarrassing then yeah. to tell your 
technician, can you please check under, under the, the tongue, tongue if we have missed something? So yeah. it's really important. Don't pull too hard. That's yeah. all I can say. Yeah. yeah. The other thing is dental floss is probably one of the worst things that you can ingest as a cat because it's very resilient. It's very thin. And it won't the break. thinner yeah. it is, the more risk you have. So these wide bands, I'm not too worried about when I see them before I go to surgery. But if it's thin, it's tinsel or anything that is thin and sharp like that, mm -hmm. that cuts through bowel quickly. very, very easily yeah. and quickly. Yeah, so there's our little... Um, so there's another one. Uh, this cat was very smart, and it's called something blue, so it was obvious, you know. So yes. I recommend if you have a cat that eats things, please leave yes. colored objects around, right? Yes. So it's a little easier to we see. We see very little trauma here, so yep. kind of it probably is, is very not too long. There's a little bit there. Mm -hmm. We can see just at one side of the tongue. We can see mm -hmm. just a little bit um, of abrasion, but... It uh, can happen. Right, yeah. So how long has this been? We don't know. So yeah. it's, it's, it's really something that, that, that people tend to miss. Uh, this cat was, as a matter of fact, referred for a foreign body that was removed. And then we found that there was still a little piece stuck. Under the so, tongue. So, yeah. you know, you can cut the foreign body, uh, take it out. Oh, it's stuck. Yeah, we'll cut it and then take it out. But, you know, if it is still here, then that's Because it good really idea. can get embedded in that. Mm -hmm. Once it starts to, you know, cut underneath the tongue, it won't easily dislodge. Right, so it's another so good what's, reason. What's the therapy for this cat? Yeah, what do you do? How are you going to treat do you that? Going to give it antibiotics? Who wants to give it antibiotics? Antibiotics. Anybody? Steroids. Some people? Yep. Who wants to give it some? Anybody want to give steroids? Put some ointment on it. <laughs> three times a day. Three, three, day, <laughs> three times a three day times for a day. the next month. <laughs> you know, yeah. the, the, the good thing about mucosa is it will heal. Yeah. It will heal. Don't yeah. do anything. I, I, yeah. I wouldn't even give antibiotics because You'd it's probably already get away with nothing. infected and it's a waste of money. Except when yeah. the tongue really swells up, the cat gets general clinical signs. But we would give but pain medication. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's probably what we would start If you want to invest in something... Invest in the pain medication yeah. instead. Yeah, so and most of the time you're not going to need anything else once yeah. the foreign body's out of You do way. want to clean it up a little bit. Yeah. So very gently, if there's pieces in there, you take them out, flush them out a little bit. Don't cut the tongue, please, because normally when you have wounds, we want to cut yeah. off stuff. Yeah. We don't do that in the tongue, except yeah. when it's thinly frailed, then you're allowed to do it. But for the rest, we just leave it. It will heal very, very quickly. Yeah, on its own. This is why you look at the yes. other end of the cat. Right? Always it's kind of a clinical giveaway yeah. that yeah. there might be a little problem might with this Might be a cat. problem. Yes. So. Yeah, I'm thinking we know the answer so to So what are we not going to do? Excellent. Right. So we're not going to pull on this end. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. So that yes. we don't want to do. Yeah. Um, but uh, because it still can be stuck. It also can, yeah. may not be. But uh, so uh, what are we doing with this cat then? Um, we're probably taking that cat to surgery. I'm Before thinking. we do that. We check under the tongue. Check it. Remember, this can be a very long thread. Yep. So it might be even still stuck there. Yeah. And then we're not going to cut the tongue and still pull it out yeah. because the whole GI tract is still yep. you know, involved in this. So th these are really tough cases. But yep. uh, yeah. So there are some serious consequences. We've alluded to a few of these already. So, of course, depending on what the foreign body is, um, especially if it's a linear foreign body and how long it's been there, there and we'll, you'll, you'll see some images, we certainly can get some significant compromise of the intestinal mucosa and even mm -hmm. some segments of intestinal wall, and that can eventually lead to some endotoxemia, um, uh, septic shock um, in these patients. And that's generally the ones that have been dealing with it longer rather than shorter, obviously. They're sort of worst-case scenarios. So uh, linear form bodies and some of the sharp form bodies like sewing needles are certainly capable of perforating uh, a solid organ. Mm -hmm. um, they're certainly per, uh, uh, sewing needles are certainly uh, capable of migrating, right? Who's seen a, a sewing needle migrate? Yeah, you probably, many, many of you have, right? Mm -hmm. So they're really good at migrating. So we're going we're gonna, to um, show you some images, but I think a good rule with sewing needles um, is if you know, you're planning to do surgery, you've diagnosed it, and then you're planning to do surgery, even if it's later that day or the next day, radiograph it again because they will move, mm -hmm. right? That's really important. And these patients often have some degree of hypovolemia or acid-base disturbances, so they really do need a good um, laboratory uh, uh, baseline so that you know, um, even the guys that are fairly quickly uh, picked up by the owner and diagnosed still may have some acid-base disturbances or maybe hypovolemic, and so we don't want to be, especially if we're heading for surgery, we want to make sure we do our best to stabilize them. Absolutely. Right? We want to keep the surgeons happy. Thank you. Yep, keep surgeons happy. I okay. appreciate that. So here's kind of my initial approach to these patients. We've already talked about, you know, a good physical exam, getting a minimum database on them because, again, a high percentage of these guys are headed to surgery anyway. 
we would like to try to buy some time and stabilize them. So try to reduce the vomiting, um, try to uh, rehydrate them. They'll be a little better surgical um, candidate if we can uh, alleviate those things if we can. And now we're going to talk to you about doing some imaging. So typically we'll start with survey radiographs, but we're also going to show you that um, modalities like ultrasound can also, especially in specific circumstances, can really be helpful for you in some of these patients. So that's kind of our general approach to these guys. So here's one of the things that uh, we're a big believer in, and that's if you're going to do radiography, how many views do we do, Yola? At least two. Yeah, well, at least two. That's good. At least two. Good answer. Some people still do one. That's true. Oh, okay, okay. And, and, and you cannot Fair enough. guesstimate where Fair enough. the foreign body is in the abdomen if you have only one view. Yeah. So two views, it gets a little easier. Do you still see Three single views? views? It's I still see met checks with, as single views. Exactly. Uh, so as matter, that okay. was another question I had for you. The category, oh, and the catagram. Catagram, yep. single view, okay. for a med check. With the two hands check. in there or without the two yeah. hands? Sometimes. It depends. You know, then it's like the trifecta. Yes. Yeah. So. Okay. So I do like three views. And Can I say one thing? Yeah. I love the fact when you have the, the hand. F- I, I get a lot of radiographs sent over, and I can immediately see if someone has a fake diamond. Oh. So. <laughs> How do you tell if it's. What is the it? zirconia looks different. It does? Yeah. How do you know that? How do you know this? <sighs> <laughs> I think this is a okay. whole, a whole I think they need a little then. lesson in, uh, yeah. you know, do you want me to test your... Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just, oh. yeah, we're all, we're all hiding our... Yeah, okay, good. Okay, Perfect. then. Perfect, yeah. Okay, mm. so other yes. than that purpose, uh, <laughs> so I do like three views with these guys because the right, you, you'll do a right lateral and a left lateral, right? So DV or VD, but right lateral and left lateral. Something happens when you shift the patient, right? What happens when you move the patient from one side to the other? Gas moves, for one thing, right? And you get a different view of some abdominal organs. So you might see something on one view, and you won't see it on the other view, especially in the abdomen. Mm -hmm. So I'm a believer in Gravity has a role, too. Yeah, and gravity, yeah, Mm -hmm. absolutely. Especially when you have foreign bodies. So... So, and the other thing that I do like is uh, being careful about compression radiography. So you know what that means? You're going to use something like, we use just a wooden spoon in my practice, but it'd be a plastic paddle or a wooden spoon, something that um, is not radio dense. And as, again, we'll, we'll only do this if that patient's abdomen is, is um, not severely painful because you don't want to harm um, any abdominal mm-hmm. organ. But a gentle compression, what it does is it just kind of separates intestinal tract from bladder right? And you can get the colon a little bit out of the way. So it kind of like flattens things out a little bit. So you don't have so much organ on top of organ, right? Yeah. So I'd be very careful. If they have severe abdominal pain, I'm not going to go there. But if we can, um, and really it's as simple as bring a big wooden spoon from home, that'll work, right? You can, you can, I'm sure a radiology company will sell you a very nice piece of equipment, but I just use a wooden spoon. And just as a surgeon, don't use barium if you want to cut them open. Everybody yeah, knows that, point. but there's still quite a lot of people that sent over cases, beautiful barium study, there's a foreign body, and I'm like, yep. come on, you know, do I need to wait? I cannot wait, so yep. I will open it up, but it is very messy. So uh, Yeah, and in cats, I really prefer the water-soluble agents anyway, so they, they, you have to work quickly with them, mind you, um, but the, the benefit of that is they're also, they also go through the GI tract quickly, so it's a little bit easier for us if we're doing surgical planning, um, and they're, they're really well tolerated by cats. Okay, so that's a few tips on... So what are we going to find on radiographs, Yola, if we... Well, we might see the foreign body, right? Yeah. But... Yeah. So, uh, as a matter of fact, yeah, so maybe we should go to the picture and, uh, okay, and, and let's, show... Okay, let's see the, what we the, have. I think the next one Whoop, we have. No, so. no, no. Let's get a picture. So, oh, there's a picture. Oh, um, can I talk about this cat? Yeah, of course. This is your favorite cat. This is my I favorite cat. I know where cat. we're going here. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Yola knows <laughs> the story. Okay, so do survey radiographs. Okay, so survey radiographs on my patient. I think we know the cause of the problem. Right? So, and, and before we go there, I was to, just to interrupt you, if you have a normal radiograph, it doesn't say that the cat has no foreign body. Yes, I, I think mean, that was... Um, it, it's a really very, very important point. Normal radiographs. If you radiographs. see a foreign body like this, you're yeah. like, okay, let's check the outside first if it's not... You know, yeah. on the floor or on your, your radiograph machine or something like that. But... Uh, However, in this cat. Yeah. So that was pretty easy um, diagnosis. The cat's got a foreign body. So this cat went to surgery and uh, had the foreign body removed. And there it is. It's actually a little button. Cat had chewed a button off of the owner's purse, I think. Guess what the cat's name was? Buttons. Button. Do you believe yes. it? He came yeah. with his own diagnosis. Yeah, so he came in. He said, Don't I have a that? button. I bet so you don't name your cat dental floss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or like, you know, um, lymphoma or, I, yeah, yeah. I like floss like as a name, though. Flossy. Yeah. You probably yeah. never get 
Do you ever get patients that come with their own diagnosis no. in oncology? Probably not. What do you mean come with their own diagnosis? You know, like button, head a button. Like a cat mm. named Flea? No. No, no, not so much. No, no one comes in and says like, my dog's name is, is yeah, osteosarcoma. Yeah, like osteosarcoma. No. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, okay. Did, I did want to name my cat Nader. Nader. Yeah, like for the low white blood cell count. Yeah. Oh, Nader. Yeah, I know. Oh. But my husband didn't like it, so. No, yeah. I think that's tempting fate. Mm-hmm. Seriously, I do. Okay, okay, button. Show button. Yeah, there. Uh, <gasps> button I know. Is I know. Holding a little hard. I can't resist. I can't resist I button. Um, on his opioid high. Look at him there. <laughs> Hi. Feeling no pain. Hi. The man's feeling no pain. He's doing good. The opinions of this podcast are those by Dr. Susan Little and Dr. Yola Kirpenstein. Veterinary medicine is a complex profession, and often there are multiple diagnostic and therapeutic options for different disease processes. If you're a pet owner with questions, please go to your local veterinarian. If you're a veterinary professional, ask your questions on our Instagram page, at Her Podcast. Dr. Susan Little is a feline medicine specialist with two cat-only hospitals in Ottawa, Canada. She is best known as an international speaker and as the author and editor of two textbooks, The Cat, Clinical Medicine and Management, and August, Consultations in Feline Internal Medicine. Along with three cats, she also admits to owning two dogs, and you can follow her on social media with the handle at Cat Vet Susan. Dr. Yola Kirpenstein is a diplomate of the American and European College of Veterinary Surgeons and a big cat fan. His specialties range from surgical oncology and reconstruction to minimally invasive surgery. He is the author of two textbooks on basic and reconstructive surgery. Did you know he was allergic to cats? Yola works currently at Hills Pet Nutrition. You can follow him on social media with the handle at GVE. TSX. 